right, everybody, welcome. Uh, thanks for stopping by. I know it's midterm this week, so uh, we won't uh, keep you too long. But this meeting today should be a lot of fun. Uh, we have a lot of skeletons and a lot of closets. Um, that said, we have a couple of events coming up. The first one is going to be our Internet of Things Village workshop interactive event. It's not quite a workshop because you are not tasked with doing anything from a lecture or instruction. It is all free. You're allowed to do what you want. These devices are not expected to work afterward. So you're allowed to experiment with them, break them, fix them, do anything you want with them. And in the end, if you break them and hack them, you've learned something. So it's a lot of fun. The event is bringing out a couple of people who run the event at DEF CON. So this isn't the, you know, our little event. This is going to be the professional who come out to DEF CON every year and run it. So that should be a lot of fun. If you're interested in that, make sure to stop by. And then the only other event is this Friday, once again, we're having our miniature Linux workshop. We had a, quite a few people there. We're filling up the room now. Um, and that means we might actually have to move to a bigger location. Uh, we're not going to go past 20 people, and we're at about 12 right now. So if you're interested, please come by on Friday. It happens in C436. And any questions on services, Linux, using computers, anything like that, we will teach you. It's been going really well. You can look at the reviews on our Facebook group if you don't believe me. And uh, hope to see you there. With that, uh, Sean is going to be doing some presentations today on um, privacy and encryption. Uh, if you haven't already heard, NASA was hacked and uh, all their information was leaked. While you may not be able to protect against things like that, you can lower your digital footprint and that's what this talk is about today. So hopefully you guys enjoy. And with that, I'll let him get started. Thanks. <laughs> OK, so yeah, so uh, my name's Sean. Um, the uh, this is a privacy primer. The idea behind this talk is to provide you with some useful information on how to, uh, just like it is said, to reduce your digital footprint. Okay? Um, that's that's All right, so that will be, again, I'm Sean. I'm also Gaten on IRC. Uh, Cliff Channel and the other channel I'm in. I'm a principal security consultant at a company called Optiv. Uh, basically, my day to day work is uh, web and mobile pen tests, which means I hack into websites uh, and then tell the website owners what's wrong and how to fix it. Uh, source code review, product connection review, things like that. Um, I, was, I used to belong to this club many, let's see, four years ago. I was vice president. I was also on the uh, CCDC team, the blue team, and the red team. I'm still on the red team every year, so if any of you show up to that, um, I will be making your life miserable. Lovely. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to go over today, um, we're going to start with the threat. Um, essentially, when, whenever you define, uh, essentially I'm giving you a series of solutions, right? So I kind of have to tell you what these solutions are solving, right? What is this threat? Why should you care about privacy? Why should you bother to any of the things I suggest in this talk. Um, we're going to go over something called little realism uh, because people kind of get romantic ideas of who's spying on you. Like everyone likes to think they're the NSA's number one target, and really not. Um, so you kind of have to define your own threat model, what is realistic for uh, your level of your level of uh, risk. Um, and then we're actually going to get into the solution themselves and what you do. Okay, so the threat, play the land. Um, essentially, when you're using the internet, it's like a series of tubes, right? Or some people would like to think that. So whenever you're accessing anything over the internet, a number of different people can see what you're doing. So your ISP, right? Uh, or if you've got the college, the college's ISP, the college's network, things like that. Anytime you access a web page, that data traverses the network. So your system admin can see what you're looking at, uh, what pages you're going to, the content you're sending across. There's varying different levels of inspection they can do to your traffic. Okay? For ISPs, this, this can come in the form of throttling. Uh, Verizon is in a big, uh, okay. Netflix is having a big problem with Verizon and a couple other providers because as people are watching Netflix, they're throttling their traffic, they're lowering the bit. Very great. I remember uh, T-Mobile's having a big hubbub with uh, YouTube because they're reducing the, uh, the bit rate of the videos you're watching, right? So whenever your ISP can see what you're doing, they can manipulate your traffic. Uh, this happens with ads as well. A lot of uh, 
especially if you're going on like Starbucks, something like that, uh, they'll insert ads into your browsing. Okay, so when, let's say you go to YouTube. Instead of getting YouTube, YouTube ads, you can get Starbucks ads. Uh, this is a big problem. Advertisers, just like I mentioned there, the, honestly, on the average person's uh, front model, advertisers are the biggest one. Uh, this is because advertisers are interested in knowing everything about you so that they can sell you all kinds of stuff. Uh, so this means they're going to track you as much as humanly possible. You go to any website that has a little Facebook like, I like icon, of, you want to like the Swift Facebook page or even just normal pages, YouTube, things like that. If you see the, little, the Facebook like icon or share any of those things, what that means is Facebook now is aware you've just visited that page. Okay, so it doesn't even matter if it's a Facebook page or not. If it's, uh, let's see, uh, ilovekittens.com, there's a, a like button on there. Facebook now knows that you visited ilovekittens.com. Okay, this happens all over the internet. Um, and to be honest, this is the main focus of this talk is to kind of avoid that kind of tracking as much as possible. Uh, evil hackers, if you're on an open Wi-Fi network or any kind of Wi-Fi network, uh, people can attack you. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about is about encryption and how to uh, encrypt your traffic. Basically, everything should be encrypted when it goes into that. Uh, then the big one, the government, right? Uh, yours or ours. Uh, and there's, um, for those, if, who, let's see, the name Snowden, raise your hand if that is familiar to you. Okay. So if any of you are not aware of who Edward Snowden is, I, I strongly advise you to Google him. Um, he uh, was a former NSA worker and contractor who leaked a lot of information about the NSA. Whether or not you agree with what he did and how he did it, the fact of the matter is uh, it shows just the breadth of uh, the information that's collected about us uh, by the government. Um, and a lot of this talk was, has been influenced by what he leaked and the um, counterattacks essentially to that. Okay, so now, need to inject a little realism right after talking about the government and the NSA spying on people and everything like that. Um, you aren't that special. You're really not. I hate to break it to you. I know your mom said you are, but you're really not. In the grand scheme of things, most of us really don't matter. Uh, whenever you hear, whenever anyone talks about uh, Snowden, the NSA, digital tracking, spying, things like that, uh, there's two different groups, right? There's active and passive targeting. If you're talking about the government specifically, active targeting means the NSA or someone decided that you personally are of great interest to them for whatever reason. They could be wrong, they could be right. Essentially, they are uh, tasking resources to specifically look at you. All right? It's the difference between, say, uh, passive targeting would be uh, stoplight cameras, right? They just kind of they watch everyone that comes through. Active targeting is a police car following you. So on the internet, what that means is, say, a, gov a government uh, agency is actively looking at your ISP records, your phone records, everything like that. Okay, they're watching where you go, what you do. That is active targeting. That doesn't happen to most of us, as far as we know. Passive targeting is the idea that they're kind of just watching everyone. Okay, this has been, uh, from a government standpoint and an advertiser standpoint, this is true. They are passively collecting pretty much everywhere you go and everything. Hey, they beat us here. Um, so what that means is the front model changes. Okay, if you're being actively targeted, then you've got to do a lot more than I will do that in this presentation. If you're being passively targeted, this will help you reduce uh, the threat. The most likely threat you have to determine what we call your threat model. As a college student, your biggest threat model is probably someone walking up to your laptop, stealing it, and running away with it. Now all of your private information is on. Okay, so, um, that being said, if you use any kind of encryption at all, uh, BitLock or anything like that, that's fine. Now we're going to get to that more. But you need to be realistic about your threat model. Okay, you need to understand who could actually be going after you. Most likely it's just advertisers and uh, this kind of massive stuff. If on, on the college campus, the college administrators will be looking at your traffic, uh, the network administrators. Um, so, anytime you, you get this kind of put on your tinfoil hat, and oh, that's great. Just remind yourself that you're not that special, uh, and you need to be realistic about uh, security you're taking. And something is always better than nothing. If you just do, like, one of the things I suggest here today, 
you'll be better off than you were yesterday. Uh, that's the point. So, encrypt all the things. So basically, we're going to start from the ground up. You have two, uh, essentially, positions for data to be in. Data at rest, meaning it's on your laptop, it's sitting there, it's in the cloud somewhere, it's your email, it's your Gmail account, and data in transit, which means you're sending an email. Now, the content that you've typed on your computer is being sent over the internet to somewhere else. That's in transit, okay? And when you protect uh, data, you need to, uh, the way you protect it is very specific to the kind of data it is. If it's data at rest, you're looking at full disk encryption, uh, encrypted files, containers, uh, data in transit, you're looking at HTTPS, uh, VPNs, like H tunnels, ports, things like port, things like that. So let's start with data at rest. So now, full disk encryption. Open source is the best. Full disk encryption means that that computer sitting right there, everything on this computer, so if someone grabs it, just runs away with it, without your password, they can't access anything. Now, if your system is not, uh, is not using full disk encryption, what that means is I can grab your laptop, I can run away with it. Even if I don't have your, say, your Windows password, your uh, OS X password, your account password, I can boot into it with a live CD or a number of other uh, utilities, and I can get all your data. Okay, that's an important thing. You have to realize that that password you type in does not prevent someone from bypassing. There is nothing in, uh, by default on the system that prevents that. Anyone can boot, live boot into your system and steal everything you have on there. If, however, using encryption, it stops that attack. Right? So let's jump in. <coughs> These applications here I looked for. Veracrypt. Okay, there was something called TrueCrypt, uh, which uh, was kind of the champion of encryption software for a while. Um, there was basically the maintainer gave up on it or we don't really know what happened, no one actually knows what it. Uh, but essentially the, the project was abandoned and uh, a, a couple of different projects have picked it up. One of the, the most uh, successful and active ones is VeraCrypt. Okay, so if you, uh, full disk encryption for Windows on VeraCrypt, uh, using VeraCrypt is uh, your best bet. However, caveat, it does not work on newer systems because of something called the GPD and uh, GPT. BIOS mode, it's, it's, if you don't know what it is, it's kind of complicated, it's kind of annoying. If you have a newer Windows system, I suggest you use BitLock. Now this gets into the conversation about, well, you know, it's BitLock from what's not open source, it's, uh, it's made by Microsoft, who has an obligation to, to support the US government, they do. Um, and then, if you go and look at any privacy forms about the locker, it's going to be a lot of talks about, oh, are the back doors, no one can look into the software, and, you know, can, can the NSA just take a, a, a BitLocker secure computer, type some magical password into it, and get into your system? Maybe. But once again, we're talking about what's your threat model, right? Most of you sitting here, if your laptop is stolen, there's a really good chance it's not by the government, okay? It's by some asshole. Yeah, it's just going to school here, right? So your threat model should be to protect from the asshole. That's what it is, right? If you need to protect yourself from the NSA, well, you know, that's good to tell. Always, 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 if you can, use uh, BitLocker if you're on OS X, FileVault uh, is a really good uh, full disk encryption software. If you're on Linux, uh, DMcrypt or Lux. Um, basically, you should all be using full disk encryption. On um, pretty much all uh, Windows, let's see, Windows operating systems, Vista, onward from uh, the Pro version, uh, BitLocker is available to you. If you don't have that, you have Veracrypt. <coughs> OS, uh, File Vault is available on all OS. <coughs> so if you don't have it, uh, or if you aren't using full disk encryption, you really should. That's uh, if you do nothing but do this today, that will reduce uh, the chances of someone. You know, if someone steals your your uh, laptop, you're screwed. But if you have this, at least they can't steal all your stuff, your piles of selfies. <laughs> Uh, encrypted files and containers. Okay, so now we talk about encrypting your whole system, right? The entire thing. However, if you want to encrypt individual files, okay, uh, you can do something called uh, VeraCrypt or TrueCrypt. That's something called containers. It's essentially, if you want to look at it, you kind of like you create a virtual disk or like a little virtual USB device on your system. Okay, this volume, as we call it, container, 
is encrypted. Okay. What that means is, let's say you leave your laptop, you log into your laptop, right? You pull this encryption hence is no longer matters because your laptop is sitting there, right? Someone comes up and takes it while your laptop is on <coughs> and you've unlocked uh, the system. If you have your files in different <coughs> containers, even though now they can see yourself, and again, your full description doesn't really matter because you're logged in, everything's available to you. If you have encrypted containers or encrypted files, now you're protected. Once, once again, you're protected again. You have another layer. Okay, so you, once again, think about the threat, right? Full description stops someone from grabbing your power down the locked laptop and running away with your files. Encrypted files containers stop someone from grabbing your unlocked laptop and running away with it. Okay? <coughs> um, hidden volumes is kind of an advanced thing, but essentially what it means is you can, using Veracrypt, <coughs> you can create a volume that inside of it has another volume that is hidden for all intents and purposes. Uh, perfectly encrypted data looks random, right, to any kind of uh, file analysis, uh, forensic analysis, things like that. If you have a, an encrypted volume, a very encrypted, encrypted volume, you can hide within it another encrypted volume. Okay, it's not, it's technically double encrypted, but it's not, that double encryption doesn't mean shit. That, if anyone ever tells you double encrypt saying bullshit. <laughs> but the hidden volume, uses a different password than your, uh, the onion volume. What you can do is you can actually, when you log, when you open this container, right, it's a program, you open it, you can type in one of two passwords. The second password will open the hidden volume. The first password will open the, the unhidden volume. All right, so even if someone gets one of your passwords, if you have another password, your hidden, your hidden volume can contain your more important things. Okay, hidden volumes are this huge, huge, concept and this huge topic. Um, if you're interested in this thing, I suggest you uh, Google Veracrypt, I work for TrueCrypt, and hidden volumes, there's volumes of information right on that. If you just want simple file encryption, does anyone know what the acronym KISS stands for? Mm -hmm. Former military. Keep it simple, stupid. That's what KISS stands for. <laughs> all right, don't overcomplicate things. Simple file encryption, I would use 7-zip or WinZip, right? It uses uh, really strong encryption by default. It's cross-platform, you can send it to someone else, they can open it. Um, there's a lot of esoteric encryption programs out there. If you're just encrypting a single file um, for yourself, I suggest 7-zip. Uh, if you're not gonna go the Veracrypt route, just use 7-zip, very simple. Uh, the cloud. Okay. This is also data at rest, right? So if you, on your Gmail account, your, all of the emails that you've written are just kind of sitting there, right? Now to get to them, you have to enter your password, you have to build this, but if you really think about this, Google can read all of your email right now. And so can anyone inside of Google systems. This means the government, you know, warrants, this means anyone who has access to your password, and uh, anyone in uh, Google itself. Um, so you have to consider this data data at rest, right? Essentially, it's unencrypted data in the cloud somewhere that, on a server that you don't control, right? You can't lock down the, the Google systems. It should be. Right, for, yeah. All right, so everyone, come and get me. <laughs> and if you haven't signed in, please sign in while you're over here. Much appreciated. Signing in helps us get pizza. You know the important thing. <laughs>
Okay, uh, let's continue. All right, so as I was saying, uh, in the cloud, right, your Gmail, your, your Dropboxes, uh, all these files, they're stored in the clear. All these emails are stored in the clear on the, uh, the systems that you don't control, right? Um, so when you're sending data, say, to Gmail, the data in transit is encrypted, right? You go to HTTPS, Gmail, the calendar, all of that, uh, it's encrypted in transit. But when it gets to the Google server, it's not crippled. Okay, there's something called a zero knowledge proof. It's a cryptography term. Essentially, what it means is on your client system, you encrypt your data and then you send it to you know, Gmail. Right? And so, Gmail has no access, uh, has no ability to decrypt anything that you encrypt on your system. Zero knowledge, that's what a zero knowledge proof means. Your file, your uh, file host or whoever it is, they can't unencrypt uh, or decrypt your data. Right? They don't have the ability to do this. Um, whenever you are looking at, say, a syncing service or an email provider or something like that, you want to think about that. Can I encrypt my data locally and then send it to them in an encrypted form so that it stays on their system in a way that they cannot act on? If you do that, for Gmail, for the your only option if you're going to use Gmail, is to use, uh, use PGP. PGP stands for pretty good privacy. It's a, essentially a way to encrypt content, uh, in this case messages, between you and people you know. Uh, to be honest, PGP is kind of a pain in the ass to set up. It really is. It's been around for I think 15, 20 years now, and it's still just it's annoying to use. Uh, I'll be completely honest. Usually, it's more effort than it's worth. Um, but if you've never heard of PGP, I strongly advise you to go uh, Google it, look it up understand what it does. It's a way for you to exchange emails or uh, any kind of file with someone you know in a way that uh, only they can open uh, what you send them. Uh, and that's very important content. Gmail can open it, you know, no one can open it except for them. Um, and PGP is also, is it? Google it. It's really complicated. <laughs> three talks just on PGP. Um, Dropbox, so uh, I use Dropbox a lot. I know Swift uses. Dropbox a lot, probably it's very, very convenient. Uh, the only problem with Dropbox is, once again, your data is not encrypted on their servers, right? Everyone who uses Dropbox uh, is essentially opening up all the files to uh, Dropbox company. Also, Dropbox also scans your content for a copyright, uh, copyright uh, infringement. Uh, they will actually remove, by, let's say you're hosting, uh, you're saving like a Star Trek movie, a Star Wars movie on your Dropbox, there's a good chance they're going to delete it. So they actually scan uh, your files for that kind of stuff. So that obviously means they can read all your files, right? That's just <laughs> point blank. Uh, an alternative to Dropbox is a service called Spider Oak. Uh, it <coughs> is what I was talking about, the zero knowledge proof. Essentially, everything is encrypted on your system using a key that only you know, and then those encrypted files are stored on the cloud, right? And it works pretty much, it's not quite as convenient as Dropbox, but it works pretty much the same. You, you drag files into it, you can share files, you can link folders with people, but instead, uh, you decide your level of privacy. Right? You decide what's encrypted on your system, you decide uh, what people know. Uh, so as an alternative to Dropbox, I suggest uh, spider <coughs> So data at rest summary. Full disk encryption, uh, Veracrypt, Bilal, BitLocker, Lux, whatever works. It, it doesn't matter, okay? Just, Use one of those four. Uh, there's a lot of snake oil products out there. Don't go with these main four. These cover every operating system uh, you can possibly have. Not possibly, but that you probably have. Uh, and they work great. Pretty easy to use. Uh, for file encryption, once again, Veracrypt containers or 7-zip and image. Cloud, uh, okay, PGP and uh, Spider. So now, data in transit, where it gets really tricky. So, 
you cannot talk about a privacy primer or uh, protecting your uh, anonymity and anonymous activity online without talking about TOR. Okay? TOR stands for the Onion Router. Who has heard of TOR? Good. Okay. TOR uh, is uh, essentially a, a technology that allows you to remain uh, anonymous so far as your location is concerned. Now, when you talk about privacy, you talk about being anonymous online, there's a very important discussion to have, which is, let's say, using an anonymous, uh, anonymizing service, whatever it is, right? And then you log into your Facebook page. Are you anonymous anymore? No. No, that's right. However, on Tor, you can do that, right? You can log into your Facebook page using Tor. Facebook does not know where you are physically located, okay? And that can be important. Neither does anyone else, okay? So it's the way I view things is it's perfectly fine to use Facebook uh, over Tor. It's perfectly fine to use all, all these things over Tor. You just have to understand what you're actually doing, right? You're protecting your location, right? Someone can't figure out you're coming from Southern California. They can't figure out you're coming from the Cal Poly campus. Uh, they can't figure out uh, your internet service provider. Can't figure out what you're doing. But realize that there are ways to identify you over the internet. Uh, that it doesn't matter, Tor isn't some magical, like, make me an honest button, like, it, it doesn't work like that, okay? It's very important you understand what's actually happening. So, let's talk about what Tor actually does. Uh, onion Rotting, okay? I shamelessly stole these pictures from the uh, Tor website. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how Tor works, okay? So you're Alice in this case, all right? Uh, and you want to uh, talk to Jane or Bob, right? On the other side of the internet, way over the other side of the internet. Essentially, Tor grabs a list of Tor servers from what we call a directory server, a list of Tor nodes, and then you get three hops, right? By default, you get three hops. You have an entry node, all right? So you talk to one computer. This entry node, there's a whole bunch of cryptography involved, all this kind of stuff. Essentially, what happens is you talk to the entry node, it passes your traffic along to two other nodes, okay? So you see the first top here, first top here, Talk to the sentry node. It passes your traffic onto this node, which then passes your traffic onto this node, which then actually finally goes to Bob. So Bob can be Facebook, Bob can be any server on the internet. Okay? So Bob only knows that your traffic is coming from this system. Okay? He has no idea about these other two, or you, which is the important part. Okay? Bob has no idea where you are, where your computer is physically located. This node here, it's called the exit node, the end node, talks directly to Bob, okay? This node knows about Bob, and it knows about this secondary node right here. However, the exit node does not know about your entry node or about you, okay? The Tor system itself is designed so that it can't figure out who you are. Now, there are attacks, there's ways to, to figure out who you are, but they take a lot more effort and resources than your average uh, system. Middle node knows about the exit node and the entry node. It does not know about you and it does not know about Bob. The entry node knows about you and it knows about the middle node, but it does not know about the exit node or about Bob. Okay? And this is how it protects you because the entire system is designed to be ignorant. And that's the point. Okay? Once, um, and that's called a circuit, by the way. This, this system right here, we call it a circuit. That's a Tor circuit. He's connecting those uh, to the endpoint. These circuits change as you're using them. So, you know, in, in 10, 15, 30 minutes later, or a new tab, depending on how the browser is configured, a new circuit node, a new circuit is uh, created to go to the Jane website. So, Reddit, or whatever have you, okay? And it keeps changing these throughout. Uh, there's a time, uh, they use a, it uses a circuit for a certain period of time, then it changes. This means that, let's say someone compromises all three of these nodes right here in this circuit. If, say, you're all controlled by the same person, all controlled by the same government, what have you, when, you're, when your circuit changes, all of a sudden they lose all that control. There's no such thing as perfect privacy, there's no such thing as perfect security, okay? But this is the best that we have. Um, Tor is an amazing technology, in my opinion, it's one of the most uh, important technologies that has been invented pretty much since the inception of the internet, especially uh, given today's climate, um, these uh, in this country we're you know we're, we're, we're blessed, we're fortunate, however you want to look at it. We have a lot of freedom. In other countries, not so much. You hear about things like Great Wall, uh, 
uh, great uh, firewall of China. You hear about uh, Russia and Iran, Iraq, and places like these. Tor is used in those countries to help, uh, say, people get access to news source that's not government control. Um, to get they access to, uh, you know, right now we have this big access from uh, Syria, right? People are using Tor inside the country to figure out what's the safe way to go? How do I get out of this place? Uh, journalists use it to protect sources. Uh, the Snowden leaks, Tor was fundamental in uh, the Snowden leaks, getting that information out. When you use Tor, you have to understand it's it's a different kind of network. It's going to be slow. It's really slow compared to what you're used to. Uh, but Tor is it's an amazing technology, and it's the privacy enhancing tool that you can use. If you don't need to use anything else from what I talked to you today, learn about Tor. It's super super important. Uh, on a letter note: encrypted tunnels or uh, VPNs. Uh, this is essentially let's say you're on a Wi-Fi network like Starbucks. Okay, it's an open Wi-Fi network. If you connect to that Wi-Fi network, anyone can basically sniff or collect all the data you use. Right? Some of it's encrypted, some of it's not. If you uh, use a SOX proxy or a, a VPN, uh, you can encrypt all of that data. So the basic picture is this. Your PC, right here, I love Twitter, you use an SSH tunnel to a server or a VPN tunnel. This can be a cheap VPS. Um, I recommend initial Ocean. For those of you who uh, want to purchase VPS, it's five dollars a month. It's pretty cheap. So everything here is encrypted. So anyone at the coffee shop can't see what's going on right here. Your VPS can see you looking at the cat radio, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's fine. What you're doing is you're protecting yourself against people in this box right here, which is the coffee shop, your internet service provider, uh, things like that. Um, so if you how to SSH socks proxy, that's a Google term. If you want to. Figure out how to do this, and I'm sure that Swift uh, has probably you teach that in your workshops. Yeah. Uh, so ask any Swift member how to do that, and they can uh, show you how to do it. Okay. So now browsers. <coughs> browsers. So we have our, our main browsers up here, right? We have Internet Explorer, we have Firefox, we have Chrome, we have Chromium, and we have Tor. Browser bundle. So I'm going to talk about these two, Chromium and the Tor Browser Bundle, because you probably know about the rest. Uh, you may not have heard about these two. Chromium is an open source version of Chrome. Okay? So the Google does basically they have the core of Chrome, and they created this Chromium project. Um, in Chrome itself, there's a bunch of binary blobs. There's drivers, and there's all kinds of proprietary stuff that Google doesn't want you to see. Uh, Chromium is basically Chrome with these binary blobs. There's some convenience loss, it's not quite as sexy and cool, it doesn't do all the kind of cool stuff, but uh, Chromium is much better for your privacy. Okay? It doesn't send every, if you use it correctly, it does not send everything you do to Google, which Chrome does, right? They're, you have to remember, Google is an advertising company. That's what they do, right? Ads. That's all they do. Their revenue is like 90% ads. They're completely invested in figuring out everything about you so that they can they can sell you better ads. That's their job on this program. They create cool technologies, they have a lot of good stuff. I have a cool phone, I like Chrome. But the reality is, their job is to spy. That's, that's basically even their obligation because they're a public company, so they have to make a profit. So they literally are legally bound to spy on you to make money. Essentially, what it boils down to. Chromium is a way to kind of remove yourself a bit from that uh, world. Firefox is a really good browser. However, the security sucks. The security is god on. Right, our Explorer is in a similar uh, light. Chrome has the best uh, security surrounding it, just the application itself. And Chromium has the same features built in. That's why I suggest Chrome over Firefox. Uh, the Tor browser bundle is a modified version of Firefox. Once again, has similar uh, uh, security problems. It's designed to be used with Tor. Okay, so essentially, it's Firefox bundled with Tor. That's what the Tor browser bundle is. Uh, it's your best option for really uh, staying uh, anonymous or uh, all of these things we talked about Tor privacy things like that. It's your best option. You can download. There are versions for Windows, OS X, 
uh, in Linux, there, it's, kind of, it's all self-contained, it's very easy to use, you just you download it, you load it up, and it works. Very simple to use. It has a lot of uh, features of Firefox pulled out of it. Okay? All, all of our browsers have a lot of tracking technology kind of enabled uh, innately in them. Right? They're, they send what you search for, they uh, up to their servers, you know, bookmark syncing, all this kind of stuff. Um, HTML5, web, uh, WebGL, they have all these data and privacy leaks. They're, the amount of issues with our current technology is insane. They're, you can go to a website and it will tell you your internal IP address, how, what programs you have installed on your computer, all from your browser. It just leaks this information. It's really bad. Uh, the whole browser bundle pulls out a lot of that functionality, so it helps maintain your privacy. Without you having to do anything. That's what I love about this. You don't really have to do much with the whole browser bundle. It just, it does the best that pretty much can be done by default, and that's why it, uh, it's so useful. If you don't want to go the Chromium route, you don't want to go the route, browser bundle route, uh, browser plugins can help uh, a lot with your privacy problem. Privacy Badger is by the EFF, who uh, sponsors Tor. Uh, anything, pretty much anything from the EFF should be, you should take a look at, because they do really good work, they have really good software. Um, Privacy Badger, it's developed for Chrome and uh, Firefox, normal Firefox. NoScript uh, is a plugin with, uh, let me go back. Privacy Badger help is kind of a learning system that helps alleviate uh, stop trackers, that mostly advertise, right? What it'll do is it'll, it'll, as you're surfing, it'll watch who's tracking, right? It'll see that your Google ad settings, it'll see the Facebook pages, things like that. As you use it more, it'll figure out, okay, it'll create a pattern, okay, this per, this, Tracker is always looking at it, right? Facebook's always following it around, so it'll block those requests. So now Facebook can't track it. Same thing with um, <coughs> AdSense. All of these, anything that it recognizes as a tracker, it will learn and do by default. You don't have to configure it. You can, and it works better if you configure it. But by default, it'll just kind of, it'll make your life better in a way that you don't even notice. And that's what's so great about it. Uh, NoScript is a little more hands-on. NoScript's prevents JavaScript from running in your browsers. JavaScript is the bane of your existence so far as privacy is concerned and security. JavaScript is an abortion of language, it's horrible. Um, <clears throat> NoScript lets you block scripts. Uh, it's only, uh, NoScript itself is only available for Firefox, if you're using Firefox. It takes, it's a bit of a learning curve because when you disable JavaScript across the board, pretty much the internet breaks. Everything in the internet uses JavaScript. That's how it's written these days. Um, so there's a learning curve to it. Um, but you'd be surprised what you can get away with. Ublock Origin is a, another, another one of those kind of you install and more or less you can forget about it. Uh, it's, it's your standard ad blocker. It'll, um, Privacy Badger and Ublock Origin uh, combined are my favorite ad blockers. I would not suggest you use uh, what's it, uh, ad blocker. Uh, a lot of these ad blocking services are now being sold to advertisers, which yeah. is interesting. Uh, a lot of the plugins uh, that you see up there, like your your standard ad blockers, advertisers are buying them up so that they can manipulate them and then let their ads through, but not other ads through. It's, it's a really weird world, uh, ad blocking. So I suggest privacy badger and Ublock Origin. I'll install the other ones and install those. Uh, basically, because they're both uh, open source and the uh, companies behind them are nonprofits, much better than you know, uh, for profit. HTTPS Everywhere. HTTPS Everywhere is a plugin that forces all, it, all of your traffic to go over HTTPS if it can. Right? So let's say you go to reddit.com. Reddit has an HTTPS version and a non-HTTPS version. Right? If you go to the non-HTTPS version, anyone looking at your traffic can see all of the Git pictures you're looking at. Right? And that's embarrassing. Let's be honest. Hmm. So HTTPS Everywhere is a plugin that forces your traffic to go over HTTPS. Right? By default. Not every website has an HTTPS uh, portion to it, most do, um, but if it does, it will force all of your traffic over it. So even if you're on you know, the Starbucks network, you aren't using a VPN, an SSH channel, you aren't using Tor, people can see your traffic, but all they can see is that you're, you're making an encrypted connection to some server somewhere, and that really doesn't matter for most people. Um, so these are all the ones I have installed. I would strongly advise you to install all these on your own system. Okay, so we talked about uh, browsers, we talked about Plugins, now we're going to talk about chat, right? And that, that other big thing we, uh, we do on the internet. <coughs> you have chat programs, you have your, your Gmail, you have your, um, uh, do people still use Yahoo Messenger? Is that even a thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But if you're going, uh, you've got Pigeon. Okay, that's a, a big popular one. Uh, one thing about Pigeon, Pigeon is a goddamn security nightmare. It is horrible. Uh, there's this, in Pigeon, there's this library called Libcurl, right? It's, it's this really complicated library that parses all the messages that come through because Pigeon supports like 30 protocols, whatever it is. That thing is a nightmare. Absolutely, it is a horrible security problem. Uh, for those of you who are interested in like uh, exploit analysis or developing exploits, run a fuzzer against libcurl and watch it disintegrate, right? So I suggest you don't use Pigeon. I would suggest you use one of these other ones. Uh, ADM, that comes with OSF, right? It's by default, it's um, a chat program. Uh, Jitsi is a, an open source kind of Pigeon clone, okay, it, a lot of the same features uh, of Pigeon, uh, uh, but there's a lot, it doesn't use the purple, and uh, there are a lot, it also uses VoIP, or uh, has support with VoIP, so encrypted uh, voice over IP. Now, like Skype, right, that's your point, right? You message, phone call, all that kind of stuff, video chat. Uh, Skype has built-in uh, surveillance capability, right? So, because Microsoft, once again, is a private company, they are kind of, they are not necessarily obligated, but they have decided to be obligated to uh, allow uh, law enforcement to uh, use their systems, right? And what this means is that at any time, you can be using Facebook and, no, I'm sorry, you can be using Skype, a government employee or anyone who has a warrant uh, with Microsoft can basically watch your Skype. They can listen in, uh, all that stuff. So Jitsi, Voice this problem by not being uh, open Skype network. Also, the VoIP uh, uses encryption that is open source uh, and is uh, much better for your privacy than Skype. I use Skype all the time, but I, I don't. When I use it, I'm talking to business customers or my mom, right? I'm, the conversations I'm having, I don't consider really, really super secret. So, uh, once again, the threat mom, right? That's how he wants to listen to me talk to my mom about whatever I talk to my mom about. That's their thing. <laughs> whatever makes you happy, man. Um, uh, Tor Messenger. Right? So Tor Messenger is uh, essentially a pigeon clone that has been uh, written, uh, rewritten to go over the Tor network by default. Tor Messenger doesn't log uh, chat messages. It uses a lot of really uh, security enhanced, uh, privacy enhancing technologies and, and uh, defaults to basically make uh, messaging as private as it can be. <clears throat> it all goes over the Tor network, which as if you recall our discussion before, essentially means whoever you're chatting to can't determine where you are in the world. Uh, there's a good chance they know who you are because, well, you're talking to them, uh, but they don't know where you, where you are, and that can be important. Also, your internet service provider can't tell what you're doing. They can't tell you're, you're talking to someone over uh, do chat. You can't tell you're talking to someone over Yahoo or Facebook, all of these things, right? Um, so you're protecting yourself against your internet service provider or whoever can see that traffic. Um, Signal Messenger. Signal Messenger is a. Let's see, is this the next slide? Yeah, okay. So Signal Messenger, let's jump to this SMS, right? Texting. You should download this app called Signal. Okay, it's available for iOS and Android. What it does is, if I'm texting with someone else who has signal, it will pretty much automatically set up an encrypted channel between you two. So when you text someone, it goes over the cell network and it lands in their phone, right? Every, anyone who has access to their phone or anyone who has that access to the cell phone network, so Verizon, T-Mobile, uh, their partners, governments, they can, they can see what that text message says. Yeah, it's, it's technically encrypted when it goes over the air. Uh, but in the system, it's not. Anyone can see that. If you use Signal, it's one of those zero knowledge proofs that we talk about, right? It's encrypted at your phone <clears throat> to a very specific person, right? So if I'm texting Joe, it's encrypted at my phone, it goes to Joe. Joe is the only person that can open that and read it, okay? Your internet service provider can't do that, government can't do that, T Mobile can't do that, only Joe can, or something takes Joe's key, right? Sick. So, and the best part of it, Best part about it is, if someone else, if someone's not using Signal, it just works like a normal texting client. All right, it's my default text client right now. So it it really do, it does not add a lot of inconvenience in your life. And that's one of the big problems with all these privacy things, right? You have to like 
Some people want you to like turn your entire life upside down. Right? It's just no one's gonna do it. It's not. It's not that important, right? Your threat model isn't that big. You just want to stop assholes from stealing your laptop and getting stuff, right? That's true. So Signal will let you continue your life with texting and selfies and all that other bullshit, but it'll let you uh, decide who can read your texts. Okay? So I encourage everyone to download Signal, and when you text them with Signal, it will figure out that they have it. Say, hey, you should set up an encrypted channel, and they'll do it for you. Very simple to use. Okay? I use it with uh, most of my friends, and it's a really important uh, app for your private app. WhatsApp, WhatsApp has uh, integrated a lot of technology from Signal into their, uh, their WhatsApp app. We're done. Um, so, WhatsApp is a really good way to essentially communicate with someone over an encrypted channel by default. It does, you don't have to do anything, it's, just, it's easy, it does it for you. Okay? So, if you're going to use any of these, you know, kind of uh, Global chat apps, uh, I would suggest WhatsApp. Okay, so in summary, data in transit, you've got browsers, right? I suggest a 12 month browser or Chromium. Uh, plugins, Privacy Badger, uBlock, and HTTPS everywhere. For chat, I suggest uh, Tor Messenger, ADM, or Jitsi. And for SMS, I suggest Signal. Okay, so now, uh, yeah, three minutes left. So. You want to kick it up a notch. If you are new all this stuff, or this, or what I've described just isn't enough for you, you understand this is perfect and you can uh, do a lot more. Basically, if you're using Windows, switch to Linux. It's much more respectful of your privacy. Okay? Once again, it's a little, it's a, if you've never installed Linux, it is not that bad. And I think, is it Friday? Uh, Joe, when are you having your Linux Friday? Okay, so if you haven't installed Linux, come by uh, their event Friday, they will show you how. It's really not that bad. It's pretty awesome. Um, Linux is much more respectful of your privacy than Windows. Okay? So that's an operating system. That's what you should be using if you're really security conscious. Uh, Tails. Tails is uh, well, uh, Tails is created by uh, the same people who made Tor. Right? Tails is a bootable operating system. So it sits on a USB drive and boot onto it, um, and, it and by default it goes over the Tor network. Okay? So the idea is you can take any laptop. Plug in the USB, you boot it up, all of a sudden you have a very, very secure, very um, privacy conscious operating system uh, that you can just use right out of the box. It's pretty simple. Okay? <coughs> Hunix. So there's Tails. Tails is like one level of inconvenience, and Hunix is a whole other level of inconvenience with a whole other level of security. Hunix is a concept uh, that uses uh, virtual machines. Okay? Virtual machines on your existing system. And these virtual machines work in tandem uh, using the Tor network to basically uh, create a very private, very secure environment for you. So the idea is you put up this, uh, you load this uh, QNIX uh, operating system, QNIX, sorry, uh, and you use it just like you would your normal computer, except uh, it's doing a lot of things behind the scenes that are making your life much easier from a privacy perspective. Okay? It's encrypting all your traffic and setting up a Tor. It's doing a whole bunch of uh, protections for you that are really a pain in the ass to do by yourself. Um, if you already know about Hunix, Hunix, look up Cubes Hunix. Cubes is this really interesting concept of operating system that uses virtual uh, machines to do pretty much everything. Okay, so the concept of isolation. Um, it's a really interesting concept. If you're really into privacy and security, you're really into uh, virtual machines and how, how those uh, can really enhance your security, I encourage you to look up uh, Q2X. It's, uh, it's really interesting technology. Uh, I think I'm pretty much out of time. So if you have any questions really quick, uh, go ahead and shoot them at me. All of these things up here, these are sites that I pull information from, sites that I use daily, uh, especially prisonbreak.org. It basically outlines pretty much everything you, you need to do to avoid surveillance or at least uh, make surveillance difficult uh, on other people. Okay? So prisonbreak.org is really good. It goes through everything from how to, how to secure your Windows machine, how to secure your network. It pretty much covers what I, what I did in just breathtaking detail. Uh, you can spend weeks and weeks and weeks reading everything out there. So I suggest you go look at prisonbreak.org. Uh, so are there any questions on anything I've covered? I know I threw pretty much everything at you. Understand all of it.
any questions at all. Yep. So Signal has to be, both have to have, uh, have the app? Both have to have the app for the, the encryption to work, right? You can text someone with it. Uh, you can, if I have Signal, I text uh, someone who doesn't have Signal, it works just like texting mine. It doesn't even need to. But in order for the, the, the actual uh, encryption and the, the privacy to actually make a difference, do something, yes. Right. Anything else? Everybody goes. Um, just so you, uh, in case you forgot, who here wants a job? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Okay. Um, last week you had the opportunity to do a challenge if you emailed Jace. Um, he's reminded me that he would like you guys to email him so you can get the challenge. It's a lot of fun. It's based off of the talk from last week. So if you want to do that, please email him. Whoever got their uh, his business card, you can send it, and I'll be putting it on um, the. Uh, slide deck for um, you guys if you need it. But he will be um, sending out the challenges and you should try it. It's a good challenge for everybody to do. And uh, with that, hope to see you guys Friday and uh, have a good rest of the week. Thank you.